You may be surprised, but hundreds of earthquakes occur on Earth every day. Most of them are in the form of small shocks so small that people do not feel them. But from time to time, stronger ones also occur, as it was on the 6th of February 2023 in the south of Turkey in Syria, where an earthquake of magnitude 7 as many as 8 tenths of a point occurred, which killed tens of thousands of people. And it's terrible. I would like to express my gratitude to everyone who participated and is participating in the rescue of people. You know, you're a hero. This is an example of what really needs to be done in a world gripped by tragedies, and not to create them. And today I propose to consider what earthquakes are, why they occur and where it happens most often, is it possible to predict them and what consequences they may have. And if you dig deeper, find out why our planet gives out a mysterious seismic pulse, known as a microspace, every 26 seconds with the accuracy of a meter. We will tell you about all this and much more in this issue. And, of course, share your thoughts and observations. So, an earthquake is a shaking of the Earth's surface as a result of a sudden release of energy in the lithosphere of the solid shell of the planet, creating seismic waves. Earthquakes can range in strength from so weak that they cannot be felt, to strong enough to destroy entire cities. On the Earth's surface, earthquakes can manifest themselves not only by concussions, but sometimes by displacements of the ground. When the epicenter of a strong earthquake is at sea, the seabed can shift enough to cause a tsunami. Earthquakes can also cause landslides and sometimes volcanic activity. What causes an earthquake and where do they occur most? As we know, the Earth has four main layers, the inner core, the outer core, the mantle, and the crust. The crust and the top of the mantle make up a thin hard shell of the surface of our planet, like the skin on the human body. But this skin is not whole, it consists of many pieces, like a puzzle covering the surface of the earth. Moreover, these puzzle pieces, called tectonic plates, continue to move slowly through the hot plastic magma, sliding past and bumping into each other. Plate boundaries consist of many faults, and most earthquakes in the world occur along these faults. Since the edges of the plates have a non-smooth structure, they get stuck while the rest of the plate continues to move. Finally, when the plate has moved far enough, the edges of one of the faults move away and an earthquake occurs. That is, while the edges of the fault stick together, the rest of the block moves, the energy that usually causes the blocks to slide relative to each other accumulates. When the force of the moving blocks finally overcomes the friction of the jagged edges of the fault, and it departs, all the accumulated energy is released. This energy radiates outward from the fault in all directions in the form of seismic waves, similar to rowan trees on a pond. There are several different types of faults. When a part of the Earth's crust shifts to the side, the result is a horizontal movement along the zigzag fault. The most famous example is the San Andreas Fault in California, which extends for about a thousand kilometers. The up and down movement in earthquakes occurs under the so-called shear fault, when the soil above the fault zone is either lowered by a normal fault, or pushed up, reverse fault. And faults that are combined with lateral movements up and down, seismologists call inclined. It happens that an earthquake appears after human actions, entailing the weakening of rocks, there is an increase in the number of aftershocks in oil and gas production sites, as well as in the locations of mines and quarries. The construction of reservoirs also has a negative impact due to the fact that water destroys rocks under high pressure due to the water column. Earthquakes are recorded by seismographs. The recording they make is called a seismogram. The device has a base firmly fixed in the ground and a free-hanging heavy load. When the earth is shaken, the base of the seismograph also shakes, but the suspended load does not. Instead, the spring or rope on which it hangs absorbs all movement. Thus, the difference in position between the shaking part of the seismograph and the stationary part is recorded. The strength of an earthquake depends on the size of the fault and the magnitude of the displacement along this fault. 
but this is not something that can be simply measured using, say, a tape measure, since the fault is located many kilometers below the surface of the Earth. The same records are used here to determine the oscillation scale. Among the main characteristics of an earthquake are the following. The depth of the hearth is usually in the range of 10 to 30 kilometers, sometimes much deeper. The magnitude is measured on a scale from 0 to 9 points. An increase by 1 means that the amplitude of the oscillation has a tenfold increase, and the energy of the earthquake increases 30 times. And also the intensity on the Earth's surface depends on the magnitude, the depth of the hearth, the distance from the epicenter and other factors. The strength of the tremors is also measured in points on a scale from 1 to 12, where 12 is an indicator of a serious catastrophe when even powerful structures are destroyed. Seismograms are also useful for determining the location. In this case, it is important to be able to see the so-called pi wave and c wave, which shake the earth in different ways, passing through it. Pi waves are faster than c waves. And it is this fact that allows us to tell where the earthquake was. To understand how this works, you can compare the waves of pi and c with lightning and thunder. The sweater spreads faster than sound, so during a thunderstorm you will first see lightning, and then hear thunder. Consequently, the pi waves propagate faster and shake the earth where you are first. This is followed by the C wave, which also shakes the earth. If you are close to an earthquake, the pi and C waves will come one after the other. But if you are far away, there will be more time between them. Looking at the time between pi and with waves, you can determine how far from this place the earthquake occurred. However, if we draw a circle on the map around the station, where the radius of the circle represents a certain distance to the earthquake, then we will know that the earthquake is located somewhere on the circle. But where exactly? Here the triangulation method comes to the rescue. This method helps to determine exactly where the earthquake occurred. The method is called triangulation because a triangle has three sides, and three seismographs are required to determine the location of an earthquake. If you draw a circle on the map around three different seismographs, where the radius of each of them is equal to the distance from this station to the earthquake, the intersection of these three circles will be the epicenter. But is it possible to predict the time of occurrence of an earthquake? Unfortunately, no. To date, many different ways of predicting earthquakes have been tried, but none of them has been successful. Concussions and ground ruptures are the main consequences of earthquakes, mainly leading to more or less serious damage to buildings and other rigid structures. The severity of local consequences depends on a complex combination of the magnitude of the earthquake, the distance from the epicenter and local geological and geomorphological conditions that can enhance or reduce the propagation of waves. Ground rupture this is a visible rupture and displacement of the Earth's surface, which in severe cases can reach several meters. Ground rupture poses a serious risk to large engineering structures, such as dams, bridges and nuclear power plants, and requires careful quartering of existing faults, which can lead to the destruction of the Earth's surface during the lifetime of the structure. Also, along with strong storms, volcanic activity, coastal wave attacks and forest fires, earthquakes can lead to instability of the slopes, leading to landslides and huge tsunamis. If everything is clear with this, then something still haunts. These are mysterious vibrations on Earth that occur every 26 seconds. Back in the 60s, geologist Jack Oliver recorded a rather unusual microspace, which repeats with a frequency of exactly once every 26 seconds. The phenomenon is called the pulse of the Earth. The researcher realized that the source of not strong, but with the accuracy of repeated tremors is somewhere in the South Atlantic. Most of the scientists' work consisted of analyzing printouts, but Jack found out that it was about surface acoustic waves. He further clarified the frequency. It ranged from 20 to 28 seconds and the total duration of the microseismic storm, which reached up to 8 hours. At that time, Oliver did not have the advanced tools that modern seismologists use. Since then, scientists have spent a lot of time observing this phenomenon and even managed to determine the exact place of its origin. This is a place in the Gulf of Guinea, 
known as Boney Bay. One of Oliver's hypotheses explaining the cause of the microseismus was that the phenomena could stimulate ocean waves, and the other was reduced to magmatic activity. Almost two decades later, in 1980, geologist Gary Holcomb also drew attention to the mysterious seismic activity, noting that it intensified during storms. The same microcyst was registered for the first time on modern equipment. The researchers again clarified the location and found several possible sources at once in the same Gulf of Venice, suggesting that the phenomenon could explain the special configuration of the continental shelf. However, another version appeared in the response scientific article of Chinese colleagues of the same year. Researchers have linked recurring microcisms with volcanic activity on the island of San Tommy there, in the Gulf of Guinea. The peak amplitudes of this ripple season, and the maximum. During the winter in the southern hemisphere, indicating an atmospheric or oceanic origin. The conclusion suggests itself that the Gulf of Guinea is a kind of center of the world, since it is in this place that the points of intersection of the equator and the zero meridian are located. There is no doubt that our planet can be considered as a living system that behaves in many ways like a living organism. The Earth breathes through fractures in the crust, and its heart beats, manifesting itself by rhythmic vibrations. There are still a lot of things in the world around us that science has yet to study and explain. Let's hope it happens sooner rather than later. And this will help seismologists move not only to the descriptive phase, but also predictively. In any case, each of us must understand how important it is to take care of our planet, because at the moment it is still the only home, the only place in the universe where we are able to enjoy a wonderful opportunity to live.